Well, the uh, hunting season is here, and when that happens, we have a, a population decrease here at church. And then one of the population decreases that we have this week is Pastor Dave is not here with us. Um, he decided that it would be a good opportune time to to do to take care of some a, a deer problem that he has uh, and eliminate some of the population there. But um, some of you I know are his Facebook friends, and so you probably saw that um, that online he uh, he's he's not by himself. Thankfully, he's got a partner in crime up there. Not that I think it's a crime to hunt, uh, but. His daughter Shelby's with him, and I, I I don't know if this is the first time she's been out with him uh, hunting, but um, but if you saw a picture on Facebook, and I, I meant to post it this morning for you to see it, but you'd see that he's having a great time. I'm not so sure what kind of a time she's having. I can't tell from her facial expression whether she's having uh, all that good of a time. <laughs> she doesn't shoot does. Well, as I'm mentioned earlier this morning, I want to I wanted to split our teaching time into part of that was because this past week, and I, I said before, I don't sometimes know if God's talking to me or if he's not talking to me. I get so many voices in my head and I need that discernment. And I had a lot of text and scripture just popping through my head and a lot of it was reactionary to the things that I'm seeing going on in and around. A lot of it's reactionary to some of the things that especially uh, I hear uh, a buzz all throughout social media because it seems like that's the avenue the greatest avenue of communication. It's how we do most of our talking. We don't even talk to human beings anymore. We talk to you and at you through the avenues of social media. It's like we call it Facebook, but we're actually never in the face of anybody. You know what I'm talking about? So that's just it. But these were all, it's like they were all reactionary. And in, in, in that, there's oftentimes that, and I, I, I recognize this, that the Bible is this incredible book of these scriptures that have all been sewn together because God is, God is its author. But sometimes I'm wondering, you know, what is this scripture connected to this one have to do with that one? How do these stories actually interweave and connect? And sometimes I don't often see the connection points. I don't see the bridge. Sometimes we just we're just a messenger, you know, and we just deliver the message. And then we pray that through some miraculous manifestation, you can connect the bridge where we couldn't because it's God's message. It's not mine. So somehow you'll be able to connect that bridge. He'll work that, th- work it out. And it's one of those things where as, as preachers and pastors, we just, we trust. We got to trust that this is what God is, is putting on our hearts to talk about. So here's, it's a very familiar passage of scripture. I spoke to you from the Old Testament, but now let's go to the New Testament. It's in Luke chapter 10. I'm assuming that the moment I begin to tell you this story, you're going to be able to find this narrative in your scriptures in Luke chapter 10. But I can tell you this, that this is a response, as it often is with Jesus, to a question that he was proposed. Now, Jesus was, I mean, he was a master teacher. I wish I could just have a sliver of Jesus' teaching abilities. He had all of the rabbinical teaching methods down. But his favorite one, the one that he used more than anything else, is this one we call the Midrash. Now, Midrash sounds like it's something that you're going to need to go get some talcum powder and rub it all on yourself because you got some chafing going on. But that's pretty much exactly what was happening. I, I think, this is just me, it's the irony that hits my head. The Midrash was there because as Jesus would tell these stories, we call it parables, but the, the rabbinical idea was that they were called midrashes, these illustrations, they left, if you will, at times, they left a a chafing with the people that heard them. You see, what the midrash was supposed to do, it's supposed to evoke a response. And sometimes the, the response that it evokes from you is it's meant to be offensive. I want to offend you so mightily that perhaps you will be evoked to respond in some action in some way, shape, or form. Whether you choose to hear what I'm saying and do the right thing, or whether you choose to ignore what I'm saying and continue in your path of destruction, that choice is up to you. And pretty much that's what Jesus would do. He would tell the midrash, he would tell the parable, and a lot of times these were responses to questions. This is one. There was a response to a question. But sometimes as we read these stories in Scripture, we're reading about something that happened a long time ago, 
in a land far, far away. And we don't live, and last time I checked, most of you don't live in a, a long time ago. You may have been born a long time ago, but you're not living in the past any longer. You're living in the present. Okay? I hope you're not living in the past. You're living in the present with the hope for a brighter future. We're certainly not living in the land far, far away to which many of these stories come from. We're living here. And I could tell you this with absolute certainty, that the men and the women who were the audiences of these midrashes, these illustrations, these parable teachings by Jesus, never in their minds would have been able to conceive that one day boats would cross this mighty ocean to a land farther away where this nation called the United States of America would pop up and become a superpower. They never thought that. They never had that in their mind. Now, Jesus, being him, self God, I'm sure he, I have absolute certainty, he knew all things. He knew it all. And we could go back in the scripture and show you some places where Jesus would, would speak right to something that's going on in somebody's heart in, in that moment. Why are you thinking those things? And he'd call them out publicly, by the way. Again, evoking a response. So here is the story. But this is not the version from the land far away. It's more of one that speaks to the present day. But I think you'll find it in Luke chapter 10. Follow along with me. One day, a Christian of America made up in his mind to test Jesus. Teacher, can you remind me how it is that I'm supposed to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the New Testament? How do you read it? And he answered, well, I must have faith in him whom God has risen from the dead. It is a living faith, which leads me to love God and my neighbor. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the Christian of America didn't fully appreciate the answer. So he straightened his back. He cast a smirk of a smile and said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied by telling this story. A man was going from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia, and he was carjacked by several persons who stole his clothes seized his smartphone, broke his ribs, cracked his skull, leaving him unconscious on the side of the road. Now it happened to be the time of a great conference, and a pro-life grouper was passing by. And when he saw the man, he passed on by. Likewise, a missionary group who had just returned from India, when they came to that exact same location, they too passed on the other side. But it just so happened that a Muslim was traveling along that same road. And when he saw the man who had been beaten, he stopped. He pulled out a first aid kit and tended to the man's injuries. And then he called 911 for emergency assistance. He followed the ambulance to the hospital. He sat overnight with the man in ICU. And the next morning, he told the hospital billing office, here's my credit card. Take care of him, whatever he needs. Now, Jesus looked at this Christian of America and with strong eyes asked, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor of the man who was carjacked? The Christian of America clenched his fist. He looked around, fumbling with keys in his pocket, and he finally looked up to Jesus, and he said, the one who showed him mercy. I'm sorry, what did you say? Uh, so that everybody can hear that? The one who showed him mercy. A little bit louder, a little clearer. The Muslim guy, the one that showed him the mercy. And then Jesus said to the Christian of America, you go and do the same. If Jesus was telling this parable as he does in the Gospel of Luke, you've probably heard it as the Good Samaritan, not the Good Muslim as I've told it. This is how most evangelicals would know it today as the Good Samaritan. But I've chosen 
to revisit that parable as the good Muslim. This year, as we've gone through this cycle, it's proven to me that we perhaps need to revisit this parable and others like it. We need to recover how we're supposed to live as Christians in this current climate because too often, church, we are seeking to justify ourselves and how we treat others on the basis of our citizenship, our ethnicity, our sexual orientation, or perhaps even our political affiliation. And these justifications lead us only to love those people who are like us. But this parable, as a parable of offense, demonstrates the power of transformative love. To love those who are in conflict with us. To share in each other's suffering. This parable is spoken to those who ask the question, what must I do to inherit life? And Jesus, I believe, is speaking to us today. Jesus is telling us this story, even in a new way. Jesus, who has shown us mercy, now says, you go and do the same. Because it will cost you time. It will cost you resources. It will cost your life. But because Jesus gives us power, the power of an indestructible life, I should say, we can go and do the same. We can show mercy to all of our neighbors as an act of gratitude for the mercy that we have received. It's very challenging, as Jesus would tell this midrash, what he does in his text in Luke chapter 10 is he uses the character of a Samaritan. He runs through the litany of the religious powerful leaders, the ones that you would expect would stop by the side of the road to help a man who has been beaten by the bandits, by the thieves. But one after the other, they fall with great amount of disappointment, not following through with the promises of their faith. For out of fear of becoming unclean, until finally it is the dog. We're back to those guys again, the dogs. It is the dog of society, the Samaritan, the half-breed, the bastards of Israel. That's the way that they thought of them. Who does the heroic Christ-like thing, who shows mercy for his neighbor. And it's the lawyer who asks the question. You can always expect the lawyers are going to ask the question. It's the, the, the expert in the law who asked the question to Jesus, who knew the law, had quoted the law to Jesus. He had quoted the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. And then he must have been following Jesus around because in other places in the Gospels, Jesus would often tag along to that and love your neighbor as yourself. And he would say, for on these two commandments, all the teachings of the prophets hang upon these two things. If you don't get anything more out of your life with Jesus, these are the big two. You need to love God, but the way that you do that is by loving your neighbor. So the lawyer, wanting to get real explicit, really real clarity on this, says, well, let's see, for the sake of argument here, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus runs him through this parable, this midrash, and I guarantee at the end of this thing, this lawyer had a little rash. He had a reaction that rubbed him the wrong way, and it wasn't just going to simply go away with a little bit of talcum powder. This rash stung. Jesus meant for it to stung. He wanted to offend. He wanted to evoke a response. You see, what Jesus does is he doesn't just simply put a Samaritan into the story. You see, what he does is if he's telling this story to you, for you it might be a Muslim who saves the man who's been beaten along the the wayside. Perhaps it's a homosexual who's the hero of this story. What Jesus does is since you're the audience, church, As you hear this story, what Jesus does is he says, I want you to close your eyes. So let's do that. Close your eyes right now. 
I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine who is the worst person, who is the last person that you would want to help you if you were the person who had been struck down by the bandits. Who would that person be? Who is the last person to which you want to receive a helping hand? That's your Samaritan. Now open your eyes. You got that person in your mind? That's what Jesus does. He pulls out of your heart the worst person, the one that you, in your heart of hearts, have already judged to have no chance of heaven. That they don't have any access to God. We've, got, we've all got those people. Don't lie. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to me. I can't lie to myself. Well, no, actually, I do a pretty good job of that sometimes. But I know I cannot lie to God. And that's who tells the story. God tells this story. He's able to look into this lawyer's heart. He's able to pull out the worst, most offensive person that that lawyer could possibly imagine. It's a dog of Israel, the bastard child, the Samaritan, the half-breed, the people who live up north who actually think that they're the children of God when they can't even worship at the temple the right way. You remember that's part of the discussion between Jesus and the woman at the well. Your people say this. My people say this. Your people say this. My people say this. The person that you had in your mind, that, that, that vile person, the person that just causes that, you know, that throw up that comes in the back of your throat that then you've got to swallow again and you've got to taste it once. You've got, you got to taste it twice. That's your Samaritan. If Jesus was telling this story to you, that's who, he, that's, that's who the hero of your story would be. Oh, and you are irked. How many, of you are, how many of us are walking away from this story going, okay, that, that. how many of you want to, and, and who was it? Barack Obama. What? I'm sorry, Jesus didn't hear you. What did you say? Uh, Barack, Barack Obama, the homosexual. The worst person. That's who Jesus would use. That's who he would use. You see, it's not about the fact that Jesus wants us to be good Samaritans. In fact, I would challenge you to say that this. Oftentimes, we read this story in Scripture, and we think that the whole point is that Jesus wants us to be a good Samaritan. Maybe he does. I'm not going to argue that charity and love is something that we ought not to show. We ought to show them. But I want to challenge you this morning by saying this. Jesus doesn't really want you to be the good Samaritan. At least that's not the point of the story this week as we tell you this story from the Gospel of Luke. Because unfortunately, when Christians hear this story, we think that Jesus is asking us to be the unlikely do-gooders in the world who bind wounds of strangers, pay for their medical bills, do so for the dist- our distant neighbors, and we offer unexpected compassion to the beaten and wounded traveler. In short, oftentimes we walk away from this teaching thinking that we're called to be the charitable ones. And as a result, we transform this subversive story into little more than a mushy morality tale about random acts of kindness to strangers that at its worst, I would tell you, are buttresses to damaging and pervasive charity industrial complex that we sometimes call the American church. We have whitewashed this radical parable. I mean, I'm talking this parable is radical into a fantasy that the privileged and wealthy in which we believe Christ calls us, and that's we are the privileged and the wealthy that Jesus Christ calls us to simply apply bandages, to throw money at the pain and injustice in the world, and think that that's enough. In this light, this parable not only justifies, but it also glorifies what I would term as drive-by charity, as the pinnacle of this command from Jesus Christ, love your neighbor. I think that love your neighbor is more than just simply drive-by charity. Because in this story, we think that Jesus is encouraging us to be like the Samaritan. But I'm not sure that he is. 
You see, Jesus in this parable isn't asking us to go and do likewise so that we can be charitable like the Samaritan. His point is much more subtle. Of course, we're going to be called to bind the wounds of the wounded. Of course, we're going to be called to take the oppressed and the downtrodden. We all know that this is what God asks of us. Works of charity and mercy are given in the life of faith. It's a given. I mean, even the lawyer in this story knows that without a second thought, he knows this to be true. So no, I don't think the point of this parable is for us to walk away from here today and go, let's be do-gooders. Instead, watch this now. You watching this? When Jesus tells the lawyer to go and do likewise, what he's asking the lawyer to do is go and imitate the Samaritan. His cultural enemy. Wait a second. You want me to walk away from this and imitate my cultural enemy. Yeah. Not me. I'm not saying that. That's what Jesus is saying. Imitate your cultural enemy as your enemy imitates God. He is asking, that educated lawyer, he's asking you to sit at the feet, woo, to sit at the feet of the other in order to learn the way of salvation. He is asking this myopic man to see the people he despises most are the very people who hold for him the key to eternal life. Life. Well, wait a second. I mean, there's no way I'm going to go sit down with that person that I imagined in my head and say, teach me about the kingdom. But if you can have the courage enough to do so, to actually sit down and have a conversation, not point fingers, Not point fingers. Part of the problem that's going on right now, all these protests, is all about pointing fingers. Sometimes it's an index finger, sometimes it's a middle one, but it's all fingers. All these protests that are going on, all these angry voices that are are being heard, whether it's in the streets or on the internet, they're all about pointing fingers. These people are acting like enemies to one another, and Jesus in this parable is challenging the enemies to sit down together and learn from one another. Because even the greatest of my enemies I can sit down with and I can learn from them if I can just have the courage enough to love them. Oh, Jesus, stop that. Stop asking me to love my enemy. It's so much easier to hate them. And hate them straight to hell than to have to love them. No, love them, sit down with them, even have the courage so far to sit down with them where? Over a meal. It's one of the things Jesus was accused of. That guy, that Jesus, by the Pharisees, that guy, he goes and he eats with sinners. Sinners are enemies of God, and we, the self-righteous, have determined who the enemies of God are because we're experts. We know who doesn't get to sit at the table. And Jesus is at the table with sinners because he loves his enemies. You know, even in that moment, they're sinners. They are, they are enemies, sworn enemies to God because of their lifestyle. Absolutely. But Jesus is still saying, have a conversation with them. Sit down at table with them. Break bread with them. Discuss things. Do it peacefully. Work things out. Talk things over. Perhaps even by doing so, you might walk away from that having found 
a friend. See your enemy as your teacher, Jesus replies to this parable. Jesus doesn't want us to be good Samaritans. Rather, Jesus wants us to know who the Samaritans are in our own lives. And then he asks us to do the hard work of seeing them as humans, just like you, just like me, not others. As teachers, people who can teach us something, not as our students. Well, you need to sit down right here and let me talk to you about something right now. Let me tell you a thing or two. You know, that's what, again, the protests are all about. Let me tell you a thing or two. As heroes, see these people as heroes who offer us salvation rather than the victims who simply just need our saving help. How horrifying, I imagine, it must have been for that studied lawyer to have no choice but to admit that the dog, the Samaritan, the half-breed, was the answer to both Jesus' question and to his salvation. As I mentioned, as you look and you read that in Luke chapter 10, you probably notice that the man can't even bring himself to utter that distasteful word. Samaritan. He doesn't even say Samaritan. Jesus actually never even asked him, like I would say, because I'm, I'd, I'd name him. Name him. Jesus doesn't wait for that name to come out. The Samaritan did. No. The lawyer's response is a good lawyer response. The one who showed mercy. The one. Which one? Well, I think everyone who's there within the sounding of this story heard and knows which one showed them mercy. From the most uneducated peasant who's there with Jesus to the very scholared lawyer who's, who even asked the question, they all know who it was that showed mercy. It was the Samaritan. History knows that it was the Samaritan that showed the mercy because we've given the title of this parable, the good what? Samaritan. The one who showed him mercy was the only response that that lawyer could give. He had begun, remember, he he comes up in Luke chapter 10 and he asks the question of Jesus. He asks him and refers to Jesus as the teacher. But Jesus redirects the lawyer to his enemy as the true teacher. That is the man, if this man honestly wanted to learn what it means to have eternal life, to look to his enemy. But the lawyer could not even bring himself to acknowledge the one who showed mercy was indeed a Samaritan. He couldn't say Samaritan. Now, you probably have already figured this out, but we all have our own cultural enemies. We have our derogatory names for them. There are slurs that we use. Sometimes we use racial slurs. We use slurs based upon homosexuality. We use slurs, and I say we. I'm talking about Christian people. I've seen this. Use slurs based on class, political preferences. If you're a progressive and you're in here today, don't forget, I've heard you say the same thing about those redneck Republicans, those uneducated right-wing nut jobs, the white trash trailers that all voted for Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. the uneducated white man. Yeah, we've heard them all. But this parable of the Samaritan asks us to confess first. First, you have to confess that you've got these cultural enemies. You've got to confess, I've got cultural enemies, and you've got to name them because God already knows who they are. And I'll tell you this, you might as well do it now because one day everything about your enemy is going to be laid bare. Confess who these cultural enemies are. Whether that uncultural enemy is, oh, here it is, an undocumented immigrant, a gay person, a poor person, perhaps one of those rural gun rights advocates, or the staunch Republican or Democrat. Then what this parable challenges us to do is it asks us to see that our salvation is found in loving these enemies enough 
to be willing to learn something from them. The problem is we don't want to learn from our enemies. We don't want them to be our teachers. Because if we're willing to learn from them, if we are willing to take the time to listen to their stories, well then, you know what will happen? It will become very difficult for us to demonize them from a distance. Sometimes when we find ourselves in the midst of someone that we've thought to be our cultural enemy, we find out, and I'm not trying to make excuses here, we find out that sometimes there's a lot of brokenness to that story. And while we rush to judgment and just determine that they don't have any access to the kingdom of God because we're the gatekeepers, we've never been able to love them enough to get to the heart of their brokenness, to do what God does best with even with his enemies. Because, you know, Scripture tells us clearly we were at one time enemies of God. Hello, church? That, that deserves an amen. Or you got to put an extra dollar on the plate. We were, at one time, enemies of God. We were God's Samaritans. We were the half-breeds. It's only God who's made us whole, who's loved us enough to come into our lives, have conversation with us, learn from us about our brokenness, and then help the process of restoration to begin so that we can move into another good R word, reconciliation. If we just continue to demonize these people from afar, if we continue to blame them for all the ail that ails our country and our own lives, if we continue to rage at them, we'll be guilty. But then what in the world do we do with our own, our own woundedness and our world's woundedness when we have no one to blame for them. I've got brokenness in my life, and, and it's easier for me just to go blame other people. My wife is always telling me, we get into arguments. I know that surprises some of you. And the, the, the response she'll have, she'll have one today. We'll probably have, an, we're going to have an argument today. You know we're going to have one. And she'll tell me this today, because this is what women do. They always remind me of it, all right? My, the woman in my life reminds me. It's always somebody else. It's never you. I hear that all the time. And you know why I have to hear that all the time? Because I can't acknowledge it, that it is me. That so, many, so often times the problem in my life is it's me. But it's easier for me just to go, I've got it right. You've got it wrong. And what sucks in the world is you, not me. You see, the lawyer in this story, he had it right. The Pharisees, they had it right. The teachers and the scribes and the Jewish experts who confronted Jesus on a daily basis throughout the time of his ministry, they all had it right. I don't need to hear none of this nonsense of love your enemies. I don't need to learn from my enemies. I don't need to sit down at table with my enemies. And what really hacked them off more than anything else, what, what drove Jesus to the cross was a, a real stark, harsh conversation that Jesus has with them when he looks at the ones who think they've got it all right, and he says, hey, you, the church people, because those were the church people of their day, okay? Hey, church people, I'm not talking to the unchurched people. I'm talking to church people. You're nothing but a brood of vipers. Jesus saved his strongest words for the church people, the ones who always thought they were right, that the problem in the world was the rest of the people. We got it right. No, you don't have it right. If you can't love your enemies, if you can't sit down at table with your enemies, if you can't learn from your enemies, because Jesus says, I sat down at table with my enemies. I broke bread with my enemies. I poured out my blood for my enemies. And I should expect the same people, same thing from the people who are called by what? By my name. Otherwise, stop tagging your name onto my name. Don't call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ and then don't behave like Jesus. You, you can't do that. There's another word from that that Jesus would say. He'd say, 
You are a hypocrite. You are an actor. You're someone who puts on a mask because that's what a hypocrite does. You see, what we do is, as the world's wealthy and powerful, we also assume that we're the world's teachers and saviors. We believe that this parable wants us to condescend the broken and the poor in order to save them, to tell them how bad they really are. So if we just keep telling you how bad and evil and how your position is completely wrong and you're never going to get it, you're never going to understand it until you come to my way of thinking. We use our positions of power to do that. That's exactly what the people in positions of power in Jesus' day were doing. They were condescending the lives of the broken and the poor until Jesus looked at them and called them brood of vipers or in a better way of saying it, I've said it, and I know it causes offense. I'm sorry, but Jesus looked at him and says, go to hell. Because it's getting in the way of my opportunity to bring these people to heaven because you want to drag them to hell with you. So since you are burning with a ticket to want to get there, just go there. I won't hold you back. But stop destroying the opportunity that we have to be able to bring these people into the gospel, into the good news of the kingdom, so that we might be able to rescue some of them. Because we're the privileged, we doesn't give us a license to break down and condescend those who are broken and poor. That does not save them. We believe we are the Samaritans and that their salvation sometimes lies with us. It does not lie with us. We are not the ones who give out salvation. It's a presumption that privileged people often think about themselves. And I would tell you this, too many people in the church are beginning to make this presumption as if we're the ones who are doling out salvation. The Bible is clear. Salvation is found in no other name except the name of Jesus Christ and in his being. It is not found in my teaching. It is not found in my position on subject matters. Of course, it's equally dangerous to assume that our cultural enemies are our saviors. Now, follow this. And that we have to simply rely on them to be our teachers. It takes the character and simply reverses it. It's a troubling assumption of the well-meaning privilege. Now, wait a second, David. You told us that we ought to let these Samaritans be our teachers. Yes. Because we are each the beaten, one on the roadside, in need of salvation for our enemies, and we are each the Samaritan with the power to save our enemies by loving them. What this parable asks us to do is it asks us to be both. Be broken. And in your brokenness, be able to offer healing. Don't think, or don't think, David, I... I can't think that I can offer you healing because I have all the answers. One of the great things that I struggled with last week, and I told Dave this, I said, you know, when you ask us to come up there and sit at a table, that's not, that is not at all what I envisioned. And it put us in a position where you, it was like we were experts or something on this subject. Like I could tell everybody how, what they ought to do. Like I, I know it all. I, I don't know it all. If Honestly, if I could figure out my, poli- my own politics, well, the end of the world would be here because that's about the time I'm probably going to get it all figured out. I'm messed up, but it's in our brokenness that we even have an opportunity to acknowledge the fact that we need Jesus, but only when we know that we need Jesus can we also offer Jesus. So not only are we the broken man at the side of the road, but we're also that Samaritan. We're Yes, we're also that Samaritan who has to love because, see, The Samaritan who shows the goodness, who shows the mercy, who shows neighborly kindness, also knows that this man who lies on the side of the road is presumed by the audience to be his enemy as well. Really at the heart of this parable is this. True healing doesn't come until sworn enemies can get together and have the courage to have a conversation and begin to work things out. Church, I think we're capable of that. I think we're actually capable of having honest-to-goodness conversations. I mean, are we? Can we possibly do that? 
But in order to do that, it asks us to heal and to be healed by our enemies, to be to our neighbors, our sisters, our brothers. And when I say sisters and brothers, I'm not talking about simply those who are in your faith family. Scott McKnight, who's an author and a theologian, wrote a book called The Jesus Creed. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. It's worth reading. The Jesus Creed. Those of you on your smartphones right now, look it up on Amazon. Download it, even as I'm talking to you. And what he does in this book is he talks about the fact that every good Jew would wake up each day as they were instructed to and would quote the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. And he would go on to say, but Jesus created a creed. He, he calls it the Jesus Creed. He says it's our, it's our Shema. As followers of Jesus, it's our Shema. Love the Lord your God, all your mind, your heart, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor to the same measure you do yourself. Just as every good Jew would wake up and the first thing that would be uttered from their mouths each morning is the Shema, he says, you know, I wonder if it would, be, it would change our perception of the day if for every good God-fearing so-called Christian would wake up each morning and they would utter the Shema of Jesus. Those two commandments that he calls us to remember. Those two commandments that he says are so big that all the laws and the prophets hang on them. What would happen in our world? Love the Lord your God. How? By loving your neighbor. By expressing to them that you're not perfect, that you're also broken. By not pointing out to them that they are broken. That's one of the other things, too, is I'm always really good. I'm always good about being able to point out broken things to people. I'm really bad about being able to acknowledge my own brokenness. I've often heard when sinners come into church, they don't always have to necessarily be reminded of their sinful condition. They know it. They already know it. They know it. It's usually the self-righteous that have to be reminded that they're still sinners. Ultimately, if we do this, we will live the eternal life today. Not tomorrow, not in some far-off one wonderment of a place that we've yet to see. We begin living life eternally today. Because by showing this love, by reaching out to those who are not like us, by being a neighbor in the sense of the word of the Good Samaritan, by sitting down with our enemies and having these conversations, we, become, we get ourselves on the path that leads to eternal life. It becomes nearer to God. And in doing so, it reminds us of the phrase that we used from Jesus' prayer it asks us to live on earth as if we're living in heaven. So this morning we're going to close. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. God calls us to live this life of resurrection. If you're living that life where you're continuing to just condescend people, to have rash judgment upon them, simply because they don't share your views of life, or because you believe that you know the truth and they're utterly lost. I would challenge you is, are you really living the resurrected life or are you still dead in your sin? God calls us to a higher plane, church. He calls the people who are called by his name to a higher plane. He expects more from the church. I remember hearing this even from that same father who would swallow the whole cake and then we would be left with nothing. He would tell me as the older brother. How many of you are the older brothers? Older sisters. Anyone? The older ones? Y'all ever hear this? I expect more from you because you're the older one than I do from the, your younger brother. Well, guess what? I expect more from you, the church. It is time for us to begin to live life as the resurrected and not simply live life as the dead. To bring people into a, a life into Jesus, not through rash judgment, perhaps through neighborly kindness. We have two 
really easy opportunities for us to even begin that journey if you've not already begun that journey. The first one, next week, invite a neighbor. Invite someone you know to come and share a time of thanksgiving. Yes, I wasn't joking a few weeks ago when I said, if you even have the courage enough, invite an enemy. Because Jesus did. He didn't invite an enemy to the table. He'd sit down to the table with an enemy. If you have that courage, fantastic. We won't even make you sit by him. We'll, we'll sit all your enemies by Pastor Dave. He can sort them out. But another thing is this. Take, take some of the information from the sharing tree this morning. Maybe one of the ways that you'll have to start sharing this gospel love is by a distance. Start with a small step. But I would also encourage you, don't just simply do that, because that just sounds exactly like just throwing money at it. But start there. Maybe take that next step to being a person that helps to deliver those packages or gets involved in the lives, because it's an opportunity for the doors to open so that these people who are living lives of brokenness can share in this the ex resurrection experience that you have. Would you stand? I'm going to pray, and the band's going to sing us out. Our Heavenly Father, you call us into this place today, and you want to transform us. And I want to confess to you, Lord, that there's some times that I think that I know what's best, that I can determine what people ought to do in order to get right with you. And then I find myself being just as guilty as this expert in the law who comes to you and says, who is my neighbor? Because, Father, I want to choose the people who are in my neighborhood. I sometimes, God, confess to you that I, I forget the simplest of, of truths. But even as a child, I learned who my neighbor was. Not simply just from this story of the Good Samaritan. I learned from Sesame Street. They're the people that I meet when I'm walking down the street. They're the people that I meet each day. God, give us the courage as the church to be neighborly. Give us the courage as a church, God, to sit down at table even with people that we think of as our enemies because they don't share our views. Give us the ability to have the courage to have good and honest conversations where we can expose one, our brokenness to each other. God, your, your scripture tells us that if we can confess our sins to one another, we can have healing. God, is it possible that when enemies can sit down at a table together and confess their brokenness to each other, that there could be a healing that takes place there? God, if you truly are the God and all things are possible, then we have to believe in faith. That's just as possible, God, that we can do that. That Democrats and Republicans can sit down together at a table and work things out, Father, for a greater good. That people who are straight, people who are gay can sit down at a table and work things out for a greater good. And Father, I know, I know, God, that you love us all. You love us all because your scripture tells us that there's nothing that separates us from your love. Father, you also tell us this. You don't like everybody because liking and loving are two different things, Lord. I want you to look down today, Father, and as you see your children here at Momentum Christian Church, I hope and pray you like us. I hope you like us because the opposite of like is enemy. I don't want us to be enemies of you, God. I don't want us to be on the wrong side of things. So help us to know, help us to again, Father, as we said this morning, to have that discerning heart. We know right from wrong. We know how to speak or how to stay silent when we need to. Help us to know what to pray for. Help us to see you. And in doing so, Father, help us to see you as the risen Lord. And then, God, would you raise us up along with you so that we can be gathered with you one day. But until that moment, help us to live eternal life today as if we were living it in heaven. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.